<laughs> Hello, everybody. Okay, so I got a quick question for y'all. Just by show of hands, how many of you have made a bad decision in your life? How many have made more than one? <laughs> okay, so now just for a moment, I want you to imagine being judged for the rest of your life by one of those bad decisions. This is precisely what life is like for 2.3 million Americans who are currently incarcerated in the United States. When they get out of prison, they can apply for hundreds of jobs, but it'll be game over the second that they have to disclose that they've been convicted of a felony. Next chapter, which is the program that I help lead at Slack, aims to put an end to this stigma in the tech industry and create new employment opportunities for returning citizens. Over the past seven months, we've been training a cohort of apprentices in JavaScript, Node, CSS, and much, much more. Why do we do this? Because we believe that talent is evenly distributed in this world. And because by 2020, there'll be a shortfall of over 1 million engineering jobs. 95% of those 2.3 million currently under incarceration in the United States will one day be released. And we have a unique opportunity to decide what type of world they're returning to. How do I know? Because I was part of that 95%. My name is Kenyatta Liao, and I'm the reentry director for Next Chapter. And up until six years ago, I was known as inmate number H10983 and serving a 25 to life sentence in prison. This was me in prison. On my face, I wore a scowl, but I was wearing a mask. Inside, I was scared for my future. I knew I wanted to change, but I just didn't know how. What my story proves is that no person, no matter their past, is beyond redemption. That we all have redeemable qualities. And what programs like Next Chapter and The Last Mile aim to prove is that if we try hard enough, there can be a new narrative. And our panel today is going to explore just that. Now I'd like to, for you to help me welcome our panelists to the stage. Come on up, everybody. Joining us are three incredible speakers. Please welcome Scott Budnick, ARC, LeJune Montgomery, CEO of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, you, and Common. <laughs> Grammy Award winning and Oscar winning activist and actor. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for having us. All right. So Common, I'd like to start with you. Yes. So, I remember reading once that uh, you had said, it's easy for us to forget to show compassion for people that we don't see. Yeah. How did you become interested in this work and where did the desire to become an advocate for folks like us come from? Well, June and I were just talking because she actually has something to do with how I became involved in this work. Um, for years, Scott Butnick had been coming to my performances and bringing formerly incarcerated people. Um, I always connected with them and related to them and wanted to give them some love. But um, I never became part of the movement of trying to free and trying to change the system. Um, I was doing a documentary that was called America Divided, and this is what Lejeune and Kellogg had come. They were actually producers on it, and I had a conversation with Michelle Alexander, who wrote The New Jim Crow. Um, I'm, from, I'm from the south side of Chicago. There's been a lot of violence and, and troubles there. So I started talking to Michelle about that's my mission. I want to help the youth like, so that we can stop this violence. Well, Michelle Alexander tied the violence into how, how the prison system is, is a father to that, how the prison system is one of the reasons why it is violence in, in the inner cities. And from that moment on, I knew I had to act more. I needed, I couldn't just show love, I needed to act on the love. And I was able through God's grace to reconnect with, with Scott. Scott took me in the, into prisons here in California. I met some of the most enlightened people ever. 
some of the most humane people ever. And I, and I realize, as you said, Kenyatta, that every person deserves another chance. And there's some human beings right in there. And I felt like if I'm going to be part of a story that's making America better, making the country better, then I got to reach for those who are being pushed down, who are being overlooked, and who are being treated less than. So that's where it, it started. It's still going on for me. I feel like it's so much more work for, for me to do. But um, I really do believe in the fact that from my first hand, seeing individuals like yourself, um, and I just met with some young men yesterday in Chicago who I don't want to go to prison. They need to be given the opportunity. So it just made me connect all this together. People given opportunities, whether they've made the mistake and come back or we can preventatively, preventatively give them the opportunity. It's our duty. And I think, you know, as much as I'm talking here, it's going to be up to each and every one of us to go home and think about ways that we can participate in that because it's not just us on a panel talking, it's like, what's the action, you know? Absolutely. You know, when I think about opportunities, it's funny because I remember sitting in a prison cell and, you know, one of the things that, that I hope for, you know, just as much as I wanted to get out of prison, I hope for an opportunity to redeem myself when I came home, yeah. you know? And um, so much of this idea of redemption in my own head revolved around work. If I came home and I worked hard, then people would respect that and I could earn you know, my way, respect back into the community, feel welcomed. Um, but Scott, you know, I know for a guy like you, you know, I mean, here you go from, how do you go from you know, producing movies like The Hangover, right, to helping create opportunities for people who are formerly incarcerated? And I, I mean, can you just give us some, a personal example of you know, what these opportunities mean to folks? Yeah, absolutely. Coming out of prison. Um, so I, I was actually, it was 2004, and we had just done a movie called Old School. And uh, a producer on that movie brought me to a juvenile hall and I, to be a part of a creative writing program. And so I go down to this juvenile hall, and I sit with uh, a dozen kids, 15, 16, 17 years old, that are facing life sentences. And I always tell this story because it was like the, the craziest day of my life. I look at this young, young man, 15 years old, looks like he's 11. And I said, how was your week? Are you doing okay? He said, it was a bad week. I just got sentenced to 300 years to life. And when we dug into his story, he stood next to his friend who shot the victim in the butt. The victim was in and out of the hospital in a day and David Negretti was going to prison for 300 years to life. And I realized in that moment, and as we went around the table and I heard all these stories, like if that, if that was my kid, They'd be out on bail, they wouldn't be sitting in the juvenile hall, and they'd have a great lawyer and they'd get probation, not 300 years to life. And just like the, the incredible inequality and just racism that was happening within the system was just so obvious on day one. And so I just dove in, and, and that first day there were kids that literally at that table that ultimately changed the trajectory of my entire life. Um, there was a kid at the table named Adam Avila who was, um, 16 years old and going to prison for six years for a robbery. And when he got out of prison, he became my prop intern on The Hangover. And that kid showed up an hour early every day, stayed an hour late every day, ran circles around everyone else, and every day was grateful for that opportunity. Every day, no matter what hit him, no matter what he went through at work, he was so happy to be there. And ultimately, after Hangover, our prop master said, I'm bringing you to Iron Man, I'm putting you in the union, and that kid makes $200,000 a year now. Wow. And so, <laughs> and there was another kid at that table named Prophet Walker, who you I know, know Prophet. Great and guy. Who, was, who was heading to prison for five years himself, and um, ended up getting his college degree uh, at Ironwood Prison, where the last mile uh, has its programming, and got to a level two prison and ultimately applied to a bunch of universities. And while he was still in the prison dorm, while he was still an inmate, he got accepted into the Loyola Marymount School of Science and Engineering. Mm -hmm. And Prophet got out. He started interning. They were so blown away from him. He got hired at a uh, engineering firm. And a year after getting out of prison, he's getting paid $110 an hour to build uh, the Ace Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so, what it really showed me is that one, like what we all see on the news every night, 
the worst story in America is what defines how people view those that are in prison. But when you walk in, you meet the most incredible and as, as common said, the most enlightened, now moral human beings that are ready to come out and, and kick ass. And um, we, when, when I left, the, I left the movie business after the last Hangover movie and started ARC, the Anti-Racism Coalition, and our goal was to set the bar incredibly high. Not just here's a job, and with a job you're not gonna be able to ever afford your own place or buy a nice car, um, no or support your family or raise your children in a community that will not lead them uh, to going into the revolving door of incarceration. Um, and so showing people pathways to a career, creating opportunities, going to the LA Federation of Labor and creating 500 union jobs a year in the construction field in Los Angeles for our members. Um, going uh, to partnering with folks like The Last Mile and being able to start our own software engineering program where we take folks through a 12-week boot camp when they leave the last mile and come to Los Angeles in the community, um, and then be able to use our connections with some of you incredible folks in the room to be able to send them to Slack, where many of them are today, right? And, and we just was, were able, in California, we have 4,000 inmates, men and women, um, that are fighting fires as inmates, um, getting paid a dollar an hour, some of them dying, but when they get out because they have a felony on their record, they can't get a job in firefighting. And to me, that sounded like modern day slavery. So we went to Jerry Brown in his last, last few months of office during the budget process, had this conversation. He said, let's start a fire camp. He put $26 million in the state budget, and we opened up the first ever fire camp in Camarillo where people were coming out and becoming firefighters as a career. And so creating those pathways to opportunity <laughs> And, and really never settling for less. Mm, I love it. I was one of those firefighters. All right. For a dollar an hour. I, know that. I was. And, How do you uh, do? What? Oh, you became man. a software engineer instead? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't really work out there? <laughs> That's another panel. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, though, uh, I, I really I feel like, you know, opportunities, when we think about opportunities for folks leaving incarcerated settings, I mean, people ask me all the time, you know, Kenyatta, you know, what, what separates you from the people that, you know, that you know, haven't been so successful in their reentry. And I'm like, you know what? Simple thing, an opportunity. Right. That's it. You know, Chris and Beverly from The Last Mile afforded me an opportunity. Mm -hmm. They went to bat for me, right? If we can go to bat for other folks, the same kind of thing can happen for them, you know? And so that leads me to my, uh, my next question. You know, we've heard a lot about love from common and redemption, you know, around opportunities for you. But Lejeune, you know, we're missing a piece here. You know, there are systemic barriers that people face that are in place when they get out of prison that are impacting their ability to reenter successfully. And so um, I'd just like to hear from a bit from you about your perspective on these systemic barriers and what we can do to change them. Great, thank you. I'd like to first just talk a little bit about um, the Kellogg Foundation and why we are in this work. Uh, our foundation is founded on the belief that all children should thrive. And as we have been doing this work for about 90 years, we understand that children live in families and families live in communities. Mm. Families need to have stability so that children can thrive and communities need to be equitable places of opportunity. And so as we've been doing this work, we've really looked at root causes of why children aren't thriving in this nation. And unfortunately, what we see is uh, racism, the vestige of racism and the structures that racism built continuing to uh, prohibit all children and families to thrive. So when we think about families, uh, this work is core to how we think about building stability in families, both mothers and fathers. And so our work uh, in that space really focuses on what are the barriers for families. And what we learn is uh, not only are we incarcerating people for all kinds of reasons, some valid, some totally uh, inappropriate, but we also then stigmatize them forever, no matter what the redemption course has been. And so this issue of ban the box is an issue that we have supported because that is a discriminatory structure that prevents people from being able to come back into a community 
and contribute to that community and participate and be a part of that community and allow their children to thrive. So that's just one simple system, structural barrier, and philanthropy had to take a stand on that. And so a few years ago, in 2016, philanthropy as a collective uh, determined that we needed to step up and absolutely ban the box in all of our organizations to make sure that not only uh, do we take that off the applications, but we also think about the background checks and how important are they and when are they important. Mm. And in our case, we determined that it's not just a common course, because that's another structural barrier, if you look at it as a given. Uh, and, you know, the one thing I like to share as a personal story is our foundation, while we're investing in this work every day, and in the last five years, we've probably put over $100 million in this space around reentry and creating career pathways so that families can become stable. But we do the work internally as well. So I was sharing uh, earlier that uh, we have a fellowship program, which is world-renowned. It takes some of the most uh, important leaders from throughout the country, and we bring them together in cohorts, and we provide a leadership program that is about restoring community and networking in community, and we build into it learning about racial equity, structural racism, healing, mm -hmm. and how can you lead through a healing frame. And what happened in our own organization is we had gone through this, this leadership interview process selecting these iconic people, and one of the individuals that got through every interview was definitely a leader. Our own organization paused because it turned out that this was a returning citizen. Mm. But we paused briefly because we went back to our values and we determined that a background check doesn't negate the process that this leader went through and rose above thousands of candidates mm -hmm. to become part of our program. Wow. Right. And some of you probably know this iconic leader. His name is Shaka Senghor. Yeah. But yes. he was our first fellow. We now have five fellows in two classes that are returning citizens. And we internally have shifted our thinking completely. And we go back to what we, uh, what we value. And that is every human, human being given an equal opportunity, no matter of their fate, to become a participating person in the economic vitality of this country. Mm -hmm. And last thing, we quantified that construct. So if you actually bring every person, working age person, and allow them an equal opportunity to thrive and be the best that they can be, either an entrepreneur, an employer, et cetera, we would actually create over $8 trillion to gross domestic product by 2050 that we're leaving on the table now because we are discounting people and not recognizing their true value. Mm. Wow. Well, it, it's interesting because it really does take a village, you know? And when I think about the community and ways that folks can add value to the community, it, it just, it never ceases to amaze me the different ways that we can make a difference. Absolutely. And, you know, I got a final question for y'all, uh, a comment I'd like for you to answer first, though. Uh, why I keep, what why should... I keep going first? Huh? Why I keep going first? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's always good. So, um, I mean, uh, the tech company, so the tech companies here, the tech community here in Silicon Valley, I mean, what can the tech companies be doing to, to continue supporting returned citizens after their release? Is it through education? Is it through example? What do you yeah. think? Well, I mean, the, the tech community and tech companies is human beings in the, that work in the tech industry, right? So first, I think one of the most important things is we recognize that we are human beings and we should care for or take consideration of other human beings. Um, as, Lejeune, as Lejeune was describing kind of economically, I was thinking like the deficit that a lot of us come from 
in our communities, it's a deficit when you're not given opportunities or jobs or drugs is being mm -hmm. pushed on you, you're being stereotyped and you're not getting a proper education. Well, we shouldn't push, you know, people down further once because they're victims of that deficit of what America has created, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's time for the tech community to be true leaders. Like we lead, you lead in like technology, but how can you lead humankind to, to the right place? And I think that is by like, not just only thinking about business, leaders, leaders of companies got to think about the people, the people that, that, serve, that they are, are their consumers, the people that they want to affect, like think about their families and then think beyond them, the people that you may not even be thinking about and like figure out ways to connect with them. I think ways to connect with them is for sure. Those, those young men I sat in front of yesterday in Chicago, if they knew that they can have access to technology, you're building for a future so these, these kids won't go to prison. Because I was the same kid that was like, my mother sent me to computer class and it made me feel like I, I could do something along with other things. Mm -hmm. So I, I heard from the mouth of these 14, 15 year old young men, man, we want jobs, we want opportunities. Well, I think that these tech companies and tech community can go beyond just saying we got a diverse board and we got diverse people here. A couple. When do you go to, go to the hood, go to the prisons yeah. and see what's really happening. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and, and I'm talking about the leaders, the leaders. One of the things Scott, Scott talked about, like with Gov when Governor Brown did a lot of the things he did. One of his right hand people who was the chief for him, God bless her soul, she's passed now. She was there in the prison with us, mm -hmm. shaking hands and, and saying prayers with people who were incarcerated for, for, with life without parole. She got to see it up close. And as Brian Stevenson always says, and I always repeat, proximity yeah. is one of the most important things we can do to, to, to be a part of change. Because once you get in front of people, you start saying, oh, this is a person. So. Of course, I'm in the preventative methods first, so let's go to these neighborhoods. I can, y'all can come talk to me. I can tell you like millions of neighborhoods that need it right now, that need some technology support or education, those kids, and I think y'all know that, but let's, let's make the effort and go do it. But then at the same token, I mean, we see the, the change. We, look, we can look at you, you're a shining example. A brother here who works at Slack, I know, named Charles Alexander, I visited him in his prison and did an interview with him in the prison that he was incarcerated in. This brother is, is living a, a great life now, working for Slack and is a, a, a beautiful citizen in this world. Like we need more companies like the stepping out doing those things. Like there's gonna be leaders and not be afraid. So, I mean, those are some of the things. I ain't got all the solutions, mm. but that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody get this man a mic to drop right now, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, you know, yeah. Uh, Father, Father Greg Boyle, he said it best, I think, that the best way to stop a bullet is with a job. Yeah. I firmly believe that. Let that marinate for a minute. Yeah. But Lejeune, can I get your thoughts on so that? So I'll just follow common. And as you were describing what people need to do, uh, we call this healing. Uh, and we believe that healing is at the heart of, of getting to racial equity and creating equitable opportunities for all in this country in the world actually, but we funded about $25 million to bring communities together to work on what we call truth, racial healing and transformation. And the, the, the purpose of this work is to build relationship in community. Unfortunately, we have lived very segregated lives and the answer to segregation is coming together is sitting down and actually having conversations and getting to know someone, another human being that is different from you, that hasn't had the experience you've had, and building empathy around their perspective and understanding that their truth is their truth and your truth is your truth. But as people come together and actually get to know one another as human beings, what we find is the underlying biases that perpetuate these systems begin to break down and allow people to collectively build structures and systems for the future that actually work for all. So basically it's really simple. For communities and for companies and for everyone, 
to get into a place for transformation, you actually got to sit down, as Brian Stevenson says, get proximate, but build a relationship with someone, get to know someone, and let's combat the segregated nation that we've all inherited and build something different for the future. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Now, Scott, I know you got some thoughts on this. I mean, I don't want to step too much. I think they've said it all. I would just say, like, elaborate what, what my man Common said, is like, this dude right here, after, after the new Jim Crow and after doing Selma, um, Mike Latt, who's in the audience right here, said, like, Common's ready to go and let's go. And we went in and just sat with, with people in prison. Um, and at the end of it, what we heard was those guys saying to us, we are not what people think. We are changed people. We are transformed people. Can you tell the world that we're good people? Yeah. Right? That's what they kept saying to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we came out and, and we, we came up with the idea. And this guy, for no money, decided to do like eight concerts and eight prisons in eight days. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about little prison concerts like dumbing it down for prison. I'm talking about bring Coachella, stage, <laughs> lights, sound, band, DJ, full Coachella show and setup onto a prison yard and like rock it. Men, men's prisons, women's prisons. And really the point was to give them an incredible experience, but we filmed everything and we're able to tell incredible stories. So he talks about Charles Anderson. Mm -hmm. Like when we went in there to Ironwood prison, we walked into the last mile. Um, and we saw Charles um, doing JavaScript, and we talked to him, and we talked to all the students in that room whose eyes had just lit up by learning this new language, and now knowing they're not inmates anymore, they're software engineers. Yes. Knowing that their path when they get uh -huh. out is not a path right back to the same places that did not have much opportunity, but opportunity was there for them and for their brothers and sisters. And um, it was incredible. So we shot a video and edited a video around Charles' story that ended up getting millions of views. And so the ability to tell these stories, right, yeah. to tell these success stories, everyone in this room knows because we all see it every night. If we let the news every night dictate who folks inside prison are, lock them up, throw away the key. Mm -hmm. We want to feel safe. We don't want to ever let anybody out. But as you begin telling the stories of a prophet who I told you about, of David Negretti. By the way, David Negretti, who got 300 to life, we ended up, ARC, who, who the executive director of ARC is now Shaka Sanghor, uh, ended up passing a bill to give 6,000 juveniles who had life sentences now the chance to go to the parole board and come home. So now David's sentence is reduced to 25 to life. Mm. Then, when Governor Brown was about to leave, he reduced and commuted David's sentence, and he goes to the parole board in three months, and he's about to join the last mile. Right. right. So, I'll wrap, I'll wrap it up by saying, like, my new initiative is um, I've raised $50 million and now raising $150 million. Um, uh, and, and I've had a hard time, easy time in New York and a hard time in Silicon Valley where they all want their next Uber, Twitter, 10X. Um, but God bless Chris Saka for, for stepping up. Um, but a, a film and television company, just like when you ask people around, the, around that marriage equality movement, like what moved the needle in marriage equality, the first thing they'll say is will and grace. Uh -huh. That like will and grace uh -huh. and glee and modern family and Ellen DeGeneres yeah. soften the electorate around marriage equality where it's now off the table. It's not even a political mm -hmm. issue, right? So now we are telling stories in film and television with which Brian Stevenson's movie Just Mercy is our first movie, but telling a criminal justice story starring Michael B. Jordan starring Jamie Foxx, yeah. starring Brie Larson, Captain Marvel, and being able to blast this out with Warner Brothers around the world. So figuring out unique ways. I don't think Slack needs to self-promote what they're doing, but by telling the story of what they're doing helps everybody. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Mm. Yeah. I mean. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, I could sit here and talk about this forever, but we're out of time today. But I want to thank you guys again for your, you. your passion, your support, and your presence here today. Let's give our Thanks, guests bro. one more round of applause, everybody. You got it, brother. <laughs>
right. So before we win, before we end, I want to close out with one final uh, thought. You know, as we think about next chapter, we can all have a role as we all can make a change. We, are, we can all can be part of breaking the cycle of mass incarceration and dismantling the prison industrial complex. We can fight for one person in your organization to go from unseen to seen. For one person to have the opportunity to fully have a second chance. Maybe you notice the panelists and myself wearing these small pins that say fair chance hiring is the new frontier. These are symbols of hope, of solidarity, and of action. And we invite you to join us and our partners in creating a new frontier by going to the Slack for Good activation space and sending a message of hope to the over 2.3 million incarcerated people in America that you too believe in fair chances. By taking a pen, you send a message of hope to someone who needs it most. You remove a small piece of the stigma that formerly incarcerated Americans face every day. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many people who do not believe that prison programs work. But I stand before you today as living proof that they do. Programs like Next Chapter and The Last Mile have helped me pave the road from a bad decision to a really great life. It's our aim to leverage Next Chapter to help others do the same. Please join us on this journey. Thank you so much.